If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, campers, hunters, outdoors people, etc., what was your downright scariest, otherworldly thing or creature encounter you've had in the woods, rural areas, deep forests? I was like 10 or 11, and I was in the woods behind my grandpa's ranch with my two cousins. It was just after lunch, and it was light out. We were poking a dead cat with some sticks when we saw an alien or some kind of monster. I don't know what the duck it was. It was white and had big eyes, and it tilted its head slightly when we saw it. I was too busy screaming and running for my life to get a good look at it, but that's what I saw. It was just kind of crouching there by a big tree, staring at us. All three of us saw it. We got back to the ranch, and we were all crying and screaming, so my uncle took his shotgun and told us to take him to where the creature was. I didn't want to go back, and neither did my little cousin, but my older cousin agreed as long as he could get a shotgun too. So they went back there, and of course the thing was nowhere to be found. No one believes us to this day, and my uncle insists that we must have seen some kind of animal, but there was no ducking way that was an animal unless it was a deformed, hairless monkey. It didn't look anything like those grey aliens or anything I have ever seen, its head was kind of triangular, and the eyes were round. The closest thing I can think of is a praying mantis, but it was the size of a small child, and what I was able to see of it was pure white. I didn't see any limbs or anything like that that I can remember, just what looked like a head and neck slash torso or something. I don't ducking no. Just thinking about it is freaking me out again. Duck that thing, whatever it was. One of my favorite places to hike is on land originally inhabited by Native Americans. The park itself encircles a pretty old cemetery with lots of Civil War era graves. I'm a fan of pre-dawn hikes because I like to watch the sun come up, and that's when the wildlife is most active, so a couple of weeks ago I took my dog there on my day off at around 6.30 in the morning. We strolled through the cemetery and then headed into the woods. I didn't see a single other person, which is normal there, it's rural and not a super well-known place, and again, it was early. We were fairly deep into the woods when my dog stopped and pointed behind us. I didn't see or hear anyone, but it's a winding trail, and it was possible it was a creature she could see or smell and I couldn't, whatever. We continued on. She stopped again. Repeat several times. I finally see a person on the trail, pretty far back, but coming up on us fast. They weren't jogging, they were just moving quickly. I picked up my pace a bit, but they kept gaining. My dog was getting more and more agitated, so I decided to step off trail to let them pass. As they got closer, I saw they appeared to be wearing some sort of mask under a pulled up hood. Not like a surgical mask, but maybe a balaclava? It wasn't cold enough for that. And then they got closer, and I realized it wasn't a mask. This person had no face. No eyes, no features of any kind. Just a black, empty void. My dog, who had been spazzing until then, didn't make a sound. She just stared. I stared. The person stared at us, I mean, the head swiveled towards us. And then they passed and were gone. I took a deer trail as a shortcut and hightailed it right the duck home. I've been back there since and haven't seen anything like that again, but I've also decided not to cut through the cemetery before sunup anymore. I was hunting in a place I knew very well. I had a very eerie feeling throughout the three-hour hike. I kept hiking up the mountain but never reached the road that cuts straight across it. I knew that if I just kept going, I would hit the road since it spans the entire mountain and I have hiked it for 30 years. All of a sudden, the woods did not look the same as they usually did, and I felt like I was being watched and became a little worried. I knew I needed to get to the road. I finally came to an opening and saw the road, but it did not look right. I knew if I walked down it, I would orient myself soon since I know the area so well. My heart almost came out of my mouth when I looked a short way down the road and saw my truck. I was suddenly at the bottom of the mountain and at the far end of the road, past where I had parked my truck. It makes no sense. I essentially hiked up a mountain and suddenly ended up at the bottom. This happened 15 years ago, and I start to quiver every time I talk about it. My only thought is some kind of black hole. I am in the south, hiking the Appalachian Trail. I am unsure of the exact location. It was after Georgia, northbound but still southern parts of Virginia. I tried doing some research, and I couldn't find much information other than the Bell Witch, which is on the opposite side of the state. So I am hiking along with my friend Centaur. It is a clear day with no sign of rain. Nothing but blue skies we are pretty distant from any town, or even a road, for that matter. The forest is clear of underbrush and has nothing but bare trees. We could easily see beyond 400 yards. About 200 yards up on the hill, we both saw a brunette woman gazing off in the distance, not looking towards us. 
this is extremely odd for this terrain, so my pal and I called out to her, hey ma'am, are you lost? The woman keeps her torso still and jerks her head towards us. The speed and angle of her head turn should have broken her neck. She let out a sharp, ear-piercing scream. It was almost like a banshee from those old stories. We ran as fast as we could with 40-pound packs on our backs. As we are running away, the wind picks up heavily. Near hurricane levels. Branches are snapping, and we even heard a tree fall in the distance. The rain started pouring. Sideways rain and strong wind I know the weather can change like a dime in the mountains, but this just felt different. Like, we were cold. From 80 plus degrees to nearly 60 or less, with a wind chill that was constant. Other hikers were caught in the rain as well. They were as confused as we were. We couldn't tell them what we saw. We couldn't even explain it to each other. We never mentioned it again. We both knew we had seen her. We continued on the trail. One day, I was walking through the woods behind my house with my dog. I walked towards the creek that ran down the hill. I dipped my feet in and felt really uneasy. I called for my dog to come back to me so we could go home. I was putting on my last shoe when, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something dash across the creek. I heard no splashing and got really creeped out. I went over to investigate and found nothing, my dog was following at my heels. Then, my dog started barking at something in the foliage and then stopped and started whimpering. I picked her up and started sprinting back to the house. And to this day, I don't go back there alone. Not even with my dog. While I was camping at Indian Mound Reservation, I was subject to a ghost's. I woke in the middle of the night to the sound of someone walking around the tent. This was an old school A-frame canvas tent set up on a pallet-like platform. I also had the chills going from the bottom of my feet, up my legs, and into my spine. I was in shock because it was the feeling I'd gotten before at the haunted house I grew up in. I called out quietly to ask if someone was there, and the walking and rustling sound paused momentarily. I then almost froze, as the sound was now the sound of a slow walk into the tent. As if someone walked right in the front door. The moonlight through the crack of the tent didn't change its size, so I know it wasn't too dark to see someone walk in, because I would have seen much more light come in. The ghost walked through the tent and out the other side. My chills were gone, but I was still uneasy because I knew I had just been visited. The name of the campsite is IMR because it's native land in Wisconsin where burial grounds are visible as mounds. I've dealt with critics my entire life. Some believe, and some don't. Once, I was exploring a rural area with friends when we were teens. We were on our way out of the area, in the car, passing some fields. Not crop fields, just undeveloped land or a clearing in front of a line of trees or a small forest. I looked to my right out the passenger window and saw a door frame standing out in a clearing, not part of a building that I could see, and it was engulfed in flames. The only logical explanation I can think of is that there was some kind of old barn base that I couldn't see from my perspective to explain the door frame, and maybe a small wildfire, I live in a very hot area that has burned bands often, had started. But really, I didn't think I saw any kind of other structure, nor did I see the surrounding grass burning. I pointed it out to my friends, and I think they explained it kind of like I just did. Regardless, it really gave me the creeps, I think because it was a liminal space like a door or passageway. Weird. We moved into my current house over nine years ago. Right beside our yard is a very old convenience store, a coal mining shop. I'm not sure how old it was, but it was built sometime in the 1950s. The building had burned down before we had even moved in. Now that I have had most of these experiences inside the house, I have seen several shadowy figures in my room, specifically, the one I've seen the most is a child who looks around the age of five. I've looked into the history of my house and found nothing, however, I've seen and felt multiple things. I've felt something tap my shoulder or pull on the bottom of my shirt when I'm home alone. Something has called out my name multiple times. But one thing stands out and terrifies me the most, a big black figure with red eyes that I always find in the corner of my room between my bed and desk, and it's always staring at me. To this day, I've only had it say two things to me, the truth isn't what you think and don't go into the woods alone. It still doesn't make any sense to me, and it's been about three months since that happened. That didn't stop me from going on the hiking trail, which used to be a mining trail that leads to an abandoned mining area, behind my house with my sister, age 14, however, my sister went into the woods alone one day on the hiking trail. She was gone longer than usual, so I started texting her, a bit worried. After a bit, I decided to go look for her, texting my dad and telling him I was joining her on the hiking trail, not to alarm him, thinking she was just chilling out by her sitting spot. As I was walking down the trail past the small old wooden bridge, 
I noticed at the other end of the road beside the trail that the same black figure stood next to my bed. I then hear my sister yelling for me from behind. I turn to her and then turn back, but the figure is gone. She asked why I was out at the bridge, and I answered, I was looking for you, you weren't answering your phone, so I got worried. She looked at me and said, I was going to head to my usual spot, but once I got across the bridge to the deer hunting trail, I saw some guy walking down it, I couldn't recognize him though. I looked at her in shock and explained what I saw. We both decided just to head back home for the day, still spooked. It's been a while since that encounter, but I have no doubt that what we saw that day was normal. My daughter shared this with me the other day, and I would like to know if anyone has any idea what this could have been. My daughter and her dad went out to cut wood, and when they got there, the dog jumped out of the truck like she normally would and went running off. He unloaded his tools and started cutting down a tree. They had been out there a while, long enough for him to have cut a tree down and started cutting it into smaller pieces, and my daughter was loading the wood in the truck. All of a sudden, she said, the air got really thick, and you couldn't hear anything of the usual noise you should be hearing. You couldn't hear the echo of the chainsaw, you couldn't hear the breeze, leaves rustling, or anything else. The dog comes running back and jumps in the cab of the truck, where she doesn't like to ride, she likes to ride in the back. Her dad threw his chainsaw and his tools in the back of the truck and said, let's go. Now it should be noted that under normal circumstances, he would never throw his tools in the back of the truck, he always cleans them and puts them away properly when he's done. When they were leaving, he told my daughter we would never talk about this again. My husband has passed away, so I can't get his take on what happened. My daughter is 35 now. I don't know why she didn't tell me about this sooner. We were just sitting around talking the other day, and she told me. This is something my great-grandfather experienced. Let's call him Auntie. When Auntie was young, he was traveling from the nearby town back to his family, who were living on the tundra. The weather was nice, with the northern lights and moon shining on the landscape. He could see very well, even if it was dark outside. Auntie had his fastest reindeer that he was traveling with. The snow was hard, so the reindeer had no difficulty pulling the sled. Then, all of a sudden, the reindeer stops. It has its tail held high, and with erect ears, it's looking at some nearby trees. Auntie tries to see what it is, but he doesn't see anything. Auntie knows that his reindeer is really tame and doesn't get spooked easily. So this time, there must be something in the trees. Then, all of a sudden, a loud cry is heard from the trees. Auntie jumps back on the sled, right before the reindeer starts running. Holding on tight to the sled, the reindeer sprints across the lake. Auntie looks behind him. His eyes open wide as he sees a small silhouette running behind him. The reindeer is running at around 60 km per hour, but the thing is keeping up with them. As they run across the lake, the silhouette is following them and crying with such an ugly voice. And he decides to stop his reindeer. The reindeer stops. He sees the silhouette approaching him, so he quickly draws the cross on the snow. The thing stops behind the cross. And he sits down and starts looking at the thing. As the thing comes closer, he sees what he had suspected. A small child with just a small piece of cloth covering its outer regions, and he had heard stories of the so-called Eheparas. And he starts talking to the Eheparas. He had heard what to do if you encounter an Eheparas. He starts by praying the Lord's Prayer. But instead of praying normally, he starts from the end and reads the prayer backwards. The child is sitting quietly in front of Auntie. Then Auntie puts his hand on the child. I will give you the name of Needle, and you are going to find peace, never having to cry again. After that, Annie sits back, and the small child disappears back into the darkness. Auntie jumps on the sled, and with his reindeer, they quickly escape from that place. After that, he never heard anything in that area. So what is an Eheparas? Back in the day, it was common for parents to leave their children to die in the woods. Either the child was sick and couldn't be cared for, or the child was born before marriage, which was a big sin. So the child would be left behind and return as an Eheparas after death. They have an ugly cry and are really fast, so escaping is impossible. They will corner people and try to run around them three times. It's said that people who let an Ipera run around them three times would turn Isane. But Ipera only wants to be baptized. In order to do that, you would have to read the Lord's Prayer backwards, from end to beginning. After that, you must give it a name, but it cannot be a human name. After that, the Iheparas would disappear, never to haunt again. Me and my friend were at another friend's house, and we were playing games. After a few hours, I and my friend had to go home. I am allowed to walk home from my friend's house as long as I stay by the pavement and walk where houses can see me. But me and my friend decided to walk through the woods because it is scary, there is no light in there, 
and it is a scary challenge. So we walked through the woods, but we didn't use our torches, only the light of the sky, and it was really dark. After about three minutes of walking in the corner of my eyes, I saw a thing on the side of the path, and I told my friend to look at it. It looked like a creature of a man hunching down in the bushes. We looked at it, and all of a sudden it started moving, and it was so scary that me and my friend just started running back as fast as we could, and we ran back out to the street. We got so scared, and I was shaking after it happened. It was so scary at the time, and after that, I don't want to walk back in the woods at night. Also, if you think it was just a rock, it's not because, when we came back, there was nothing in that spot. It was really a thing that was hunched, and it looked at us and moved. A few years ago, I went on a weekend trip with some friends to a remote cabin in the woods. The first night there, we were all sitting around the fire, telling scary stories, and laughing. As it got later, we decided to head inside and get some sleep. I shared a room with two of my friends, and we all settled into our sleeping bags on the floor. It was pitch black, except for the dim glow of the embers in the fireplace. Just as we were starting to drift off, we heard a faint tapping sound on the window. At first, we thought it was just a tree branch, but then we heard it again, louder this time. We sat up and looked out the window, but we couldn't see anything outside. Then, we heard a soft voice whispering our names. We were all frozen in fear, not knowing what to do. The tapping continued, and the voice got louder and more insistent. Suddenly, the window flew open, and a cold breeze rushed into the room. We could see a dark figure standing outside, but its features were indistinct. It seemed to be beckoning us to come outside, and we felt an overwhelming urge to obey. But just as we were about to get up, the figure vanished, and the window slammed shut. We were all shaken by the experience and couldn't sleep for the rest of the night. The next day, we tried to rationalize what had happened, but we couldn't come up with any explanation. To this day, we still don't know what or who we saw that night in the woods. Two things in one night, both involving the same friend, both involving my need to go to the bathroom. At around 10 p.m. so I left our site to use the restrooms, which were about a one quarter mile away. It's pitch dark. As I was walking, I saw one of my friends who was with us walk from a path leading to an unused site onto the main path. This unused site path was a good 50 yards away from our site path. My friend has a very noticeable and peculiar gait, way of walking. So I knew it was him. At multiple points, he turned around and asked, why are you following me? He was always a good 40 or so feet ahead of me. I would reply, I literally told you guys I was going to the bathroom, and ask, why did you come from a different site? He picked his pace up, and I eventually lost him in the darkness. I get to the restrooms without seeing him, take my shit, and upon returning to my site, where he of course is, I start asking why I'm being ducked with. Everyone denies my friend even left. Okay, so they're ducking around, no big deal. 3 AM rolls around, and I wake up needing to pee, no need to walk to the restrooms this time. I'll just walk off into the woods a bit. As I walk back after my piss, I hear the distinct sound of a tent zipper opening. In the darkness, I can tell it's my friend, and then I can barely see but definitely hear him zip it back up. As I get closer to the tents, I see him more clearly, and he walks a bit. He goes to light a cigarette. I can see his face and the flint strikes of the lighter, even clearer when it manages to catch. He lights his cigarette, takes a puff, and says, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. What's up? Again, much louder this time, can you hear me? Me yeah. You trying to wake everyone up? He kind of shakes his head at me, then turns and walks towards the cars. Maybe 30 feet away from him. Thinking I'm being ducked with again, I go to follow. Lose him behind a car. I turn the corner of it, and he is nowhere to be seen. I'm pissed, he thinks he's so funny. So I go back to his tent. It's still closed, and I can hear him faintly snoring inside it. I'd quote it was I saw exactly, but it looked, sounded, and walked, just like my friend. I was slightly inebriated, but not enough to hallucinate. He denies he ever left his tent or went through the woods ahead of me. I was a stupid kid, 13 to 16, fascinated with hunting but did not grow up in a family that ever hunted. I got my first BB gun, and I went into the woods to see what I could possibly get. I remember coming to a part of the woods where it was a swamp and there used to be an old farmhouse, which when I was younger, like two to three, used to be still standing, but at the time was nothing more than just the foundation or chimney. It was dusk out, everything was grey and shadowy, and I heard huge wings and saw a large bird land on the top of a dead tree. I saw its body shape and thought it were some owl or something, and now looking back, I love them and how majestic they are, but they are stupid and probably illegal to hunt. Ike, 
I had a fascination with nature and a lack of knowledge of hunting, but I was a stupid kid and shot anyway. As I saw the large bird drop, not quite sure what it actually was, it made a horrible screech on its way down to the ground, and I instantly regretted what I did. No less than a second later, the whole wood started screeching and howling with the most terrible sound I have ever heard. I heard in the trees around me, in almost all the trees, this weird screeching but more like whooping. Like, 100 witches started howling and whooping started coming from every direction around me. I ran home, which was about a one quarter mile from where I was, as quick as I could run. I only remember this now and have looked up every owl distress call I could find for my area, and I couldn't find anything similar to what I heard that night. Needless to say, I'm an avid outdoorsman, and I have the utmost respect for nature and the creatures that live in it. I would never want to hunt anything unless it were to feed me and my family. But that night, which I oddly forgot about until now, was one of the most eerie things I've experienced in the woods. Ever heard of the hide behind? I have, and I'm lucky to be able to tell the tale about the crazy encounter I had one day while I was out in the woods. It was a warm summer morning when I decided that I needed a little fresh air and adventure. I had just left my incredibly stressful job of six years as a case manager for the elderly. I packed my bags, broke my lease, broke up with my bum boyfriend, and moved back home with my parents. They lived in a really cute part of Maine that was basically in the middle of nowhere. It was perfect and exactly where I needed to be to figure out my future. I packed my backpack, got in my jeep, and headed for a local hiking trail. The morning was young and full of potential. I arrived at my destination, grabbed my gear and my map, and headed out. I have never really been a fan of hiking or nature, to be totally honest, but I needed a change. The trail was beautiful, and there was so much to see and explore. Due to being so captivated by nature's beauty, the day had gotten away from me, and before I knew it, the time was about 4 in the afternoon. I had found a waterfall and a quiet little spring where I decided to go for a dip in the water. I felt a little uncomfortable, though, because, for some reason, it felt as if I were being watched. Occasionally, I could hear breeches snapping as if someone or something were walking around the perimeter of the spring I had discovered. I was out in nature, though, so it could have been anything. I quickly ate my lunch, and that's when I thought I saw something moving behind the trees. I turned to get a better look, but nothing was there. I took my phone out, but of course I had no service out here in the middle of nowhere. The weather suddenly changed drastically, as if it were going to downpour. There was nobody else around, and I began to get really scared, so I began heading back to my jeep. At one point, I stopped walking to catch my breath and take a drink of water. It was then that I heard the trees and bushes rattling. I call out to see if anybody is around, but nobody answers me. I shout a few more times just to be sure, but no response follows. I have this dreadful feeling as if someone is following me or at least watching from a distance. I quicken my pace because something is clearly going on, and although I am almost sprinting down the trail, the sounds remain close behind me. The faster I run, the faster the sounds appear to follow. Twigs were snapping, and the bushes were swaying back and forth violently. The sounds were so thunderous, as if a whole army was following behind me. These sounds were not only frightening, but they seemed to be the only thing I was able to hear, and they were getting closer. I felt like I was going to vomit or pass out from the adrenaline and fear mixing together. If whatever was following me managed to catch me, I don't know what would have happened, and I wasn't about to become a gone missing poster in the local police department. I quickened my pace to a full sprint until I reached the end of the trail. I felt like I was flying on cloud nine, but I still wasn't fully safe yet. As I began getting into my jeep, I saw something in the rearview mirror standing at the entrance to the trail from where I had just emerged. It had to be about 7 feet tall, covered from head to toe in thick, snarled hair, with two large vampire-like teeth stained with blood and two sinister, glowing yellow eyes. I blinked, and the thing was suddenly gone. Back into the woods, I hoped, but I wasn't sticking around to find out. I hauled my ass home and told my folks about what had occurred during my outing. I was so shaken and upset, but my parents didn't seem as surprised as I had expected. They not only believed me but also told me a story about these creatures called the hide-behinds. Apparently, they are creatures that hide behind trees, lurking around the woods, hoping to get in reach of unsuspecting prey. The story claimed that if the hide-behind were to catch you, it would drag you back to its cave, where it would eat you while you were still alive. Later that week, I got my photos printed out, and, much to my own horror, in every photo, you could see the very same pair of yellow eyes that I had seen at the trail entrance that day from my jeep. It appeared to be hiding behind the trees in every photo. The next day, I got up, packed my bags, and headed back to Boston. This experience assured me that I would never hike in the woods again. I was up in bear country around a reservoir, 
and we had a great campsite all alone, unimproved, meaning it was a place people have camped at before but by no means built in or official, with an incredible view. It was just my girlfriend and me, we had food we cooked by the fire and eventually headed off to bed in a three-man tent, so there was not a ton of space to go around. I had brought a shotgun and rifle, both with rounds capable of stopping an average bear, but I didn't want to find out for sure. So after we are asleep for about 20 minutes or so, probably sometime between 11 p.m. and 12 a.m., I start to hear things moving around as I'm woken up. Thinking that this really isn't too big of a deal, I try to go back to sleep, thinking that it's probably just a deer or smaller animal passing by. I start to hear noises again, and this time they're closer and more distinct, almost like how a person sounds in the woods. The nearest people we knew of were at least a few miles away and would not easily be able to get to us or our car, which, I should mention, was probably 100 yards or so from the campsite. It couldn't make it all the way up the faint, rocky road. So at this point, knowing that we can't just run and bears are notorious in the area, I remember that our food is sealed away with the fire essentially out, but the sealed cooler was 50 yards from our tent. It couldn't be, there's no way they could smell anything in it, so what was walking around? Maybe I just screwed up, and it can smell it. I leaned over to open up the little zip window, saw nothing, and went back to sleep. Within less than a minute of lying down, I hear something run its hands, paws, or whatever else along the walls of our tent. Scared at this point, I try to ward off the intruder with the sound of my shotgun loading. But not only does it not stop, but it starts to make noises all around. My girlfriend, awake at this point, is frozen in position, about to cry. Realizing that our only choices are flight or flight, I rip open the door to the tent with a gun in hand, only to find literally nothing anywhere at all. We left as soon as we could. To this day, I have no idea what that was, but it was so vivid that it couldn't have just been the wind of my imagination. I guess it sounds like one of those you would have had to have been their stories, but believe me, in the middle of nowhere, it's terrifying. I love walking in the woods, but some strange things have happened in the woods. It was a beautiful day for a hike in the woods, so I grabbed my backpack and set out on the trail. The sun was shining, the birds were singing, and the leaves rustled gently in the breeze. As I walked deeper into the forest, I noticed that the sounds of nature had grown quieter. It was as if the forest was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. That's when I saw her. A woman dressed in white stood at the edge of a clearing. She looked like she was from another time, with a long, flowing dress and a ribbon tied around her waist. At first, I thought she might be lost or in trouble, so I approached her cautiously. But as I got closer, she vanished into thin air, leaving only the sound of rustling leaves behind. I was shaken, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I needed to follow her. So I continued on the trail, my heart pounding in my chest. As I approached the clearing where I had seen the woman, I heard the faint sound of music. It was a haunting melody, played on a violin. I stepped into the clearing and saw her again, the woman in white, dancing to the music of an unseen player. She twirled and spun, her dress billowing in the breeze. But then, as suddenly as before, she vanished again, leaving me alone in the clearing. I left the woods that day feeling haunted by the memory of the ghostly woman in white. I never saw her again, but I'll never forget the feeling of being watched by something not quite of this world. When I was 12, me and my younger brother used to travel up over the border to a small town in Northern Ireland to visit our father, as my parents had divorced. My dad, being a firm Protestant, insisted we rejoin a Protestant scout group called the Boys Brigade. We had left it a good few years prior due to moving across counties and there being no installation where we had moved. So now that we could attend it again, we were drafted in, and off we went. For anyone wondering, it isn't at all like American Scouts. It's like Sunday School Plus, you sit around, read scripture, learn marching drills, play football, dodgeball, etc., all inside a massive church hall, and then every so often you go on day trips off to different places. This one particular trip had us going off for an overnight weekend stay in some adventure camping compound way up in the forest adjacent to a coastal town. Rock climbing, kayaking, orienteering, etc., but much more controlled and set out. It would be less like wild camping and more like showing up to this place and getting our own dorm rooms with bunk beds in them. Wake up and go have breakfast in the cafeteria. Then go do some activities, get dinner, and finally go back to the dorms for the night. So upon getting to my dorm room, I picked the top bunk next to the window, and when it came time to sleep, I was lying on my side looking out when I noticed there was an old tree stump directly ahead of me. The stump was directly ahead in a straight line as you exited the dorm complex, so anyone walking out to go get breakfast in the morning would see it. You could not notice it, as it was just there. 
So the next morning I woke up late and everyone else was already walking down to get breakfast, so I pulled my clothes on and ran down to catch up, and as I exited the main doors, I saw a woman in a white dress sitting on the tree stump, just combing her hair. This woman had bare feet, and she did not look like she belonged there. Remember, this compound was completely empty bar of scout boys and our brigade leaders, so seeing any type of person there would raise some alarm bells, but the fact it was a woman in a clean white dress with bare feet in the middle of a compound in a forest just combing her hair was just unnatural. I rubbed my eyes as I knew I was seeing things, and nope, they were still there, so I did what any scared boy would do. I ran the hell out of there, back up to my dorm room, and nervously looked out the window to see that she was now gone. I waited until a brigade leader came up to tell me to get out to breakfast and told him what I saw, he didn't buy it for a second and ushered me out the door. The next day we went home, but it has stuck with me all these years, supernatural or not, it wasn't normal and still gives me shivers thinking about there was no rhyme or reason, even if it was just for a normal woman to be there. My best friend and I lived 10 years in a village. When I was 15, my family moved to a small town near the village. It was okay because you had to walk for only 45 minutes. Between these two places, there was a forest. Every time one of us had to walk there in the night, we called each other. It was a short but creepy street with a large dog, forest animals, and sometimes drunk people, and we felt safe while talking. One day, it was deep in the night, and he called me again. But it was different. He sounded scared, and I heard some kind of laughter, in the background. I asked him what that was, but he didn't want to talk about it. He only asked me to tell him something, so he didn't have to think about it. As he walked, the laughter didn't get quiet. It's only a five-minute walk in the forest, but it had to be less loud. To date, we have no idea what that was. Some people say it could be a bird or some other animal, I know some animals sound very strange at night. I live in Germany, so there are no mountain lions or tropical birds. The laughter had the sound of someone mixing a witch and a psychopath. Some details could be a little bit different, it's been like eight years. I never heard something like that again. It was Halloween. I was about 11 or 12. I lived in a neighborhood surrounded by forests. Magnolia Forest, to be exact. My friends lived in the next neighborhood over. The two neighborhoods were separated by the said forest. We would take trails to get to one another's houses. This Halloween night, I went to their neighborhood to trick or read. I was supposed to be home by, like, 10 o'clock. I was late. I took off down the trail and headed home. The trail was only lit by moonlight. I was scared, but the trail was pretty easy to traverse. I was certainly moving as fast as my feet would take me. About halfway down the trail, I ran into something like, boom. I fell hard. I looked up, and there was a dark figure blocking my path. It was tall, broad, and seemed to have some sort of stuff hanging from it. It didn't make a sound. I was so scared, I just sat there. Frozen. It didn't move. I finally gained enough gumshoes to take off, and I did just that. I bolted all the way home. I never looked back. I scared the poo out of me. So when I was 16, I was a boy scout. We went winter camping in this log cabin, and a few of the older kids and myself waited till dark and hiked about a half mile off into the woods. We were trying to find a spot to smoke pot and cigarettes. So we formed a ring, and we were all sparking up. We were in an area filled with dense trees. Dark giants linger above us, creaking in the winter wind. I start getting this feeling of being watched. I shine the flashlight at each of the trees in our immediate surroundings. My light settled on a man leaning against a tree. An older man, very pale skin with a white beard, this was no one we recognized, and we were somewhere no other person should logically be at the moment. He didn't seem to react at all to us or the light, he just remained still while beaming that dead stare at us. The four other guys with me also saw him, and one of them was my brother, we just talked about this story the other day. So we got spooked and left. Nothing happened when we got back to camp. I sometimes wonder, what was this guy doing? He was just standing in complete darkness and staring at some kids with grim intensity. It makes me think he was actually just a confused and lost spirit. On the Indian reservation, I have two stories. These were told to me by my Sioux neighbor. I will call my neighbor, Jim. 1. When my neighbor was around 14, he, his dad, and a brother went to the reservation forest for hunting. It was very late at night, probably midnight. He was sitting in the back of the truck with his brother on their way to the campsite, with their dad driving carefully between the trees. The truck stops for a moment, I can't recall why, and Jim, brother, and dad get out of the truck. They are walking their separate ways, just looking around, attempting to find one last hunt of the night. 
After a few minutes, they get back in the truck. The trees were slightly further apart, so they could move a little farther. Jim noticed the forest had gotten silent, no crickets chirping, nothing. He sat still and listened. He kept going until, a minute later, he saw his eyes glowing. It was big and impossible to see well, but based on the height of the eyes, Jim knew he was huge. His first thought was a mountain lion, but those are extremely uncommon in these areas. He also knew a mountain lion would not hunt a moving truck, as they typically go after animals that are completely unaware of them. Jim yelled at them to drive faster. His brother was talking through the back window to their dad, completely ignorant of the fact that there was a monster behind them. The thing reached forward, and at this point, brother has finally turned around. His claws scraped across the back of Jim's hand slightly. Whatever it was, it was close, however, after what felt like minutes of looking at him had only been mere seconds, the beast turned around. To this day, Jim believes something scared him off. He is an avid believer in the supernatural, Bigfoot, and the like. He said that after that moment, the forest came back to life with sounds. 2. Jim is hunting with his brother. He is just a little bit older now. They are a few hundred feet away from one another, to the point where they have to yell over to each other. They are quiet, scanning the area, when Jim hears laughter. Children laughing. There were a few of them. He's alert, looking in every direction. Suddenly, he hears crying. Those same children are crying. He doesn't see anything. He calls over to his brother, did you hear that? A bit worried. Hear what? Those kids. They were laughing and started crying. Oh. His brother proceeds to tell him that this area of the woods is very haunted. There is a cabin about a half mile to a mile away. A while back, there was a man who saw these three kids playing outside. He began playing with them in the large, open forest before he proceeded to end them. They were no older than 12. To this day, they have not caught the man that I am aware of. You can still hear their innocent laughter, followed by their terrified weeping. My dad's many strange hunting experiences. Experience 1. He used to hunt with a hunting rifle but has now started alternating between a crossbow and a bow because it is quieter and easier to hunt than with a hunting rifle. My dad, like I mentioned, was out hunting, and I'm assuming he fell asleep in his car while waiting for a buck to appear. He looks out the window and sees this prize-winning buck, he's words, not mine, a couple feet away from him. Excited, he raises his gun and sets fire at it because our other uncles have already gotten their prize buck, expect him, and he wanted to get one himself. But when he looks through the scope, there's nothing there. He lowers the gun, and there's the buck in plain sight. He raises the gun again to fire, zip nothing, and open space. She lowers the gun again, the buck is still there, but she is looking away from my dad. Very confused, he raises the gun up again, gone again. My dad is thinking, what's going on? Lower the gun, this time the buck is really gone. He was so confused, and by the time my uncles returned to the car and they headed home for the night, nobody was able to figure out if the buck was real, a figment of my dad's imagination, or a forest spirit playing a prank on him. Experience 2. My dad was out hunting again with one other uncle in this newer area about three to four years ago. Instead of the area of the previous experience, it was almost winter when this strange and creepy encounter happened. My dad was already high up in his tree stand for hours, just waiting for a buck to appear. It does, but it's so far out of range that he wouldn't be able to get a clear shot when he notices a woman in a white dress walking around a few feet below him. He was confused about why she was walking around in a dress in that condition and wanted to call out to her, but something in the back of his mind told him not to. So he just silently sat in his tree stand and waited. Eventually, she walked away and out of sight, in the direction of where our uncle was located. My dad continues waiting for maybe another half an hour before climbing down and calling our uncle about the woman in the white dress. What woman? Dad, the woman that walked in your direction half an hour ago. Uncle, I never saw anyone, and there shouldn't be anyone else but us out here. They were both confused, but it was enough to scare our uncle into wanting to get the heck out of there. My dad didn't want to leave and instead wanted to stay a bit longer. After some convincing, our uncle talked my dad into leaving, and my dad proceeded to mock and tease him about the woman in the white dress. They both made it home perfectly fine. But our uncle is too scared to go hunting there by himself now, after what happened. A few days later, my dad's leg just started hurting and swelling up for a couple weeks. Our other uncle, who's a shaman, not a hunter, thinks maybe they offended or disturbed something while out hunting. My dad denies it, but was told to go back to the area, during the day, and apologize for whatever they might have disturbed. My dad, being a stubborn guy, refused to, but after a while, 
he and our uncle, the one who went hunting with him, went back and apologized. A few days later, his leg was all better, as though nothing had happened. Creepy, and that's why I never want to go out hunting or in the woods at night because anything can happen, and I hate being outside after dark. I was hiking with my boyfriend in northern Macedonia. We were camping one night in the middle of nowhere, next to a closed mountain cottage. In the afternoon, there were no people around, so we started to set up our tent. This big shepherd dog came and started to hang around, he was not aggressive, so we have let him be. Around 10 pm, it was already dark, and a pack of stray dogs appeared next to our tent. They were barking and growling, and we were scared as duck. My boyfriend wanted to leave the tent and chase them away, but I told him not to be stupidly heroic and to try to sleep. Well, sleep was complicated because we knew that there was only our tiny tent keeping the pack away from us. Suddenly, the big shepherd dog laid down next to the tent, literally 10 centimeters from my boyfriend. He started to bark and growl at the pack, and I am quite sure that he was protecting us from them. The dogs left around midnight, and we were able to get some sleep. Thank you, big doggo, for chasing the pack away. I also promised myself to always carry pepper spray with me while hiking. It was very scary. My brother and I decided to hike to the saddle of the mountain that the cabin was on and then hike back down. To be clear, this wasn't in the middle of nowhere. This mountain had probably 12 other homes on it and a dirt road that led about halfway up. About halfway up the saddle from the cabin, we stopped to rest, and my brother wandered a bit further to get a better view. That's when I looked to my left and saw a shadow about 20 feet away. It was a silhouette of a man, to be more precise. Like a man would have been standing there but had been cut out from reality, just leaving a pitch black void in the shape of the guy. We looked at each other for a second, and then he silently slipped behind a tree. At that moment, my brother came back and said, if it's okay with you, let's just cut our hike short and go back to the cabin. Of course, I agreed, and about halfway back to the cabin, my brother said, I know how crazy this sounds, but while we were up there, I swear I saw a silhouette of a person following us. I told him what I saw, but we didn't bring it up to our parents because we knew how weird it sounded. That night, we went into town to eat dinner, but my sisters wanted to just relax at the cabin. When we got back from dinner, we found my sisters huddled in the bathroom with the door locked and completely freaked out. When my dad asked what happened, they said that they went downstairs to grab a snack and saw a silhouette of a man walking silently down the hallway away from them. It had happened a few minutes before we got back. I wouldn't call it true camping, but I went to a site in the Czech Republic on a riverside. It was a cold and wet evening, and we had considerable difficulty getting a fire started, but by one in the morning, we found ourselves predictably drunk and warm at the fire. As we joked and carried on, a dark figure emerged from the tree line. Before we even have time to register who or what it is, it steps into the firelight and is revealed to be a woman. We offer nervous greetings in both Czech and English, but she gives no response. She simply sits on the ground by the fire and begins warming her hands. After several attempts at conversation in any language, we simply give up and continue carrying on as if she weren't there. It's wet out, and if she had trouble starting her own fire, we don't mind if she shares ours. So, we continue as we were, but as time goes on and I continue taking looks at her from the corner of my eye, I notice something strange about her. She's wearing a longish t-shirt that has gone down to her upper thighs while standing. Though her legs had been exposed, I assume that she just had short shorts on. This is not the case. Sitting on the ground, I realize that she is wearing literally no bottom. Her legs are crossed, and I am staring straight into the depths of her womanhood. I slide my eyes to my friends and recognize that several of them have recently come to the same realization. We continue to not acknowledge her existence for about 20 minutes more until she stands up, nods her head at us without a word, and simply walks back into the tree line from which we came. It was strange, mainly because we never saw any hint of expression or even an attempt at any language. I can only assume she still lurks in the forest to this day. My friend, Astrid, was the most beautiful soul I've ever met. She was the kind of person who would do anything for her friends, and when she was with a person, she was 100% invested in them, their story, and their life. When she asked how someone was feeling, she genuinely meant it. She was the friend who made me want to be the best version of myself. A friend I would do anything for, even if it meant leaving my comfort zone far behind. That's why, when she led me down a narrow path in the remote Michigan wilderness along the vast Lake Superior, I followed her unquestioningly. I didn't remember exactly how we got there or what came before. All I could think of were my immediate surroundings. 
the lapping of the waves against the distant shore the cry of the gulls circling for fish the slight chill of the August air as it weaved through the towering pines was promising an early autumn this year, but the warmth of the sun against my skin let the air know summer wasn't quite done playing. Most importantly, out of all of those things, I saw my beautiful companion. My best friend in the whole world is walking in front of me, talking and laughing. There was no place else I would rather be. My heart was full. I followed her without question, not knowing, or even caring, where we came from, where we were going, or hell, even what time of day it was. I was usually a meticulous planner, but the details I would fret over before a trip simply did not matter. I couldn't help but notice how lovely she looked. I mean, she was always radiant, but this time she was simply ethereal, almost unnatural. Her wavy brown hair fell gracefully to her lower back, emitting a soft glow I assumed was from the sun. She was in her best hiking outfit, REI pants, keen boots, and an LL Bean wicking shirt. She even wore the bright red scarf I made her for Christmas this past year. I noticed her boots made no sound as she walked, making her look as if she were floating. A fairy princess led me into the mystical forest. I laughed aloud at the thought, the sound stopping her abruptly. She turned to face me with a questioning look. Where are you taking me, dear? I asked. She pressed her finger to her lips, urging me to be silent, then pointed ahead of us to where the trail broke through the trees, leading to a cliff overlook. I walked ahead, and as I got closer to the cliff, the blissful feeling I had throughout our journey turned to a bitter coldness within my heart. I stopped just shy of the cliff, not wanting to go any farther. For some reason, I was afraid. Afraid to look over the edge. I felt something ice cold on my shoulder. It was her hand. She squeezed reassuringly, urging me to go forth. When I got to the edge, I felt a gust of cool air whip my face. As I squinted my eyes for a better look, a flash of bright red appeared on the lower edge of my vision. My heart was pounding. I looked down, and there it was. The scarf I made Astrid for Christmas last year the one she was just wearing. But how? I turned around, and she was nowhere in sight. I stepped back into the woods. The path we walked turned out to be more of a makeshift footpath or deer path. I frantically tried to retrace my steps. I didn't get too far when I saw a group of individuals in neon vests walking side by side. It looked as if they were combing the forest. I looked down at my own clothes to find I was always wearing a similar vest. As if a spell were broken, I realized why I was here out in the woods. Astrid had gone missing last week after a solo hiking trip. I managed to tell the police where her scarf was. Sure enough, her body was found in the lake shortly after a boat was dispatched to the bottom of the cliff. The most wonderful day in my life spent with my favorite person ended with me losing her forever. When I was a teenager, I used to live near a forest, Le Bois de la Tour. It was well known for being a haunted place since a tower used to bond the woods to the nearest city, underground, so prisoners could evacuate the prison during World War II. According to my old relatives, there was a fire that killed the ones who were escaping, they destroyed the place and sealed the underground. Eventually, my friend Marine and I had a lot of fun there and spent crazy days. It was usual for us to walk in the woods anytime we wanted to scare each other. In the middle of the forest, there was this abandoned paintball field, in western cowboy style. There were some axes, a fake graveyard, real knives, and broken cars. We called this place full face because of a big flag at the entrance fence where those words were written. One day, as we were playing like the kids we were, we heard footsteps in the distance. We immediately thought there were some older people, since we found some needles and alcohol bottles. The perfect squat for hidden crimes as we decided to hide behind cars, the sound seemed closer than ever. We waited, observing everywhere around us. But there was no one. Just this constant noise of something regular was pushing on the leaves. The sun was going down, and we knew we had to come back home. But what if these people we heard were dangerous? These people we did not even see. As the sky turned darker, we noticed the silence. Now was a good time to leave. But when we came out, the same damn thing occurred again. Marine started to cry, and we ran like never before. We knew the forest and found a way to leave the field, but the flag vanished, and someone definitely moved the objects we played with when we were hidden behind the old cars. In the woods, everything is the same. There was no wind, then, the full face flag literally flew in the air under our eyes, and the leaves kept on scratching around us. I felt like the top of my head was freezing, like some cold water had fallen on me. In the end, we managed to leave the field and never come back. Now I'm a grown adult and can't explain this flying flag, the leaves, or this cold feeling. Sometimes, when I'm driving my car, I'm watching the abandoned field by my window while I'm waiting at the red light in the distance. When I was around 12 years old, 
I was at my cousin's house for a party, I'm pretty sure it was around Christmas time. We were hanging out in their backyard in woods, part of their backyard is a wooded area, and came to this tree that used to have a tree house in it. All that is left of that tree house are some steps leading to it and a few platforms, not safe to get up if you can even at all. My cousin, 8 years old at the time, told us this story about how the kids who had that tree house died when it collapsed. I, personally, thought this was a bunch of bees but went with it. We eventually headed back to the house, but I decided to go back into the woods alone. As I was walking into the woods, I felt a strange sense of calm wash over me, like I was safe there, safer than anywhere else. As I'm walking, I'm looking around, and I see a light blue and white checkered flag up in a super thin tree that I didn't notice before. As I'm looking at this and trying to figure out how it got there, I start hearing her kids' voices, laughing, talking, and just having fun. I didn't think too much of it at the time, as my cousins were out in the tree house, a new one they built, not the old rundown one. As I'm walking closer to the old tree house, the voices seem louder, and I look back up at the flag. It was moving despite there not being any wind. I shocked it off, as I couldn't feel the wind from down here, but up there there was wind, and I looked back down. That's when I say them. Six children had white skin, like snow white skin, there was no snow on the ground, BTW. They all seemed to be wearing winter gear, though dull and dirty looking. They were walking towards me, but I didn't run, I wasn't afraid for some reason. I heard a branch snap, and that's when I ran. As I went back towards my cousin's house, I was surprised to see that they weren't outside. I found them in the living room playing video games. When I asked them when they came in, they said, when you were walking to the woods, why? The kids I heard weren't them. I still don't know, to this day, who those kids were. They weren't other neighbor kids, as if they lived close to my cousins. Were they figments of my imagination? Whatever it was, it's one of the reasons I believe. When I was in high school, I worked at a Boy Scout camp on the Buffalo National River. It was a summer camp slash high adventure outpost, and I spent two summers working there, the summers of 14 and a month and the summer of 15. When I started working there, older staff members started telling me stories of how haunted the camp and the trails it gave access to across the Buffalo River were. Things like children laughing in the distance, blood-curdling screams coming from deep in the woods, a haunted cabin across the river, and a slew of other, for lack of a better term, campfire stories. The first experience that was truly strange at the camp was the second weekend I had been there in the summer of 15, a friend of mine that I worked there with who will call him, had told me stories of a moonshiner who used to work near the camp, he told me that a still was out there and wanted to go find it, given it was our day off, and a beautiful summer day, I jumped on the opportunity to hike, we head out of camp, crossed the river and carried on up the trail, we ran across a group of the high adventure staff, and asked one of them we knew fairly well if he had heard of a still in the surrounding area, he immediately answered yes, and pointed directly off the trail to our right, telling us that we would run into a creek in the woods out that way, and to follow it away from the camp until we came on a rock outcropping the creek ran over. Having the directions we needed, we stepped off the trail about a half mile from the river, and within about a minute, we found the aforementioned creek. We both crawled inside, and we found it empty, with the exception of some thin copper tubing and a couple of mash pans that had greatly deteriorated. We hung around for another five minutes or so investigating the place and noticed trails leading off in the opposite direction we had come in, not well-made trails, but more like the type created by deer. I noted this then, and my friend seemed convinced they were moonshiner trails. He wanted to follow them and see where they led. Rolling my eyes again at his suggestion of them being hooch runner trails, I followed him, not having an issue with getting more chances to see nature and enjoy the day. I followed along, looking to the left and right of me as I went, taking in the view. We followed these trails uphill that ran alongside the same creek for probably about a quarter mile before M turned to me and said, Hey, let's go back to camp, I don't feel so good. I thought nothing of this and turned around. We walked back the way we came for probably about 10 minutes, and I noticed M was sweating more than he had been before. He just told me the sun must be getting to him and kept walking. I had him drink some water, and he seemed normal, albeit quieter than usual. We carried on, and my worry faded as he was walking and breathing normally. As we walked, I continued to look around and, at some point, zoned out, staring at M's backpack. I eventually ran into the back of M's backpack and was snapped out of my thoughts. I pushed his backpack forward and told him to get moving. No response. I shook his shoulders and asked if he was okay. All he replied was look and raised his finger, pointing directly ahead of us. This was the still we had been in not even a half an hour beforehand, and immediately to the right of the door was without a doubt the most blood-chilling thing I've ever seen. As soon as I laid eyes on it, 
I was hit with the most real sense of dread and fear I've had in my whole life. It was as if I knew I wasn't supposed to be seeing it, and I was paralyzed, frozen still. A black shape stood about seven tall, motionless, although its composition appeared to have some sort of movement within it. It struck me as a shadow at first, and I immediately looked up to see if there was anything that could be casting it, nothing, just the forest. I looked back quickly and looked at the object for another five seconds or so before it started moving. It moved itself directly center on the doorway, it compressed down to the height of the doorway, then rushed in. I had thought that it was just a shadow, but when it moved, I could see there was dimensionality to it, and after looking at it for a few seconds, I could make out what seemed to be thick black smoke within this shape and filling it. It seemingly disappeared as soon as it entered the still, and before I could say a word, M was sprinting back towards the main trail and camp. I rapidly followed him, and neither of us stopped until we reached the river crossing and could see other staff across the river. As we sat there, catching our breaths, neither said a word. I sat listening and turned towards the woods we had just come out of, half expecting to hear or see something crashing through the woods behind. It was silent, all I could hear was my own breathing and the sound of the river's feet behind me. No birds, no squirrels, no human voices, despite staff and even outsiders using the trails frequently on the weekends. As I was taking my shoes off to ford the river again, M asked me, what in the duck was that thing? I simply responded with a shrug, not having the nerve to break the silence all around me. I was still hyper aware of how quiet it was while we were crossing and was almost slammed by the noise I experienced when we finally hit the other side. Birds were chirping all over, the wind was making the leaves on the trees rustle, and the voices of our fellow staff members carried through the field normally. M never said anything about the sound, but I honestly think he was so shaken he hadn't noticed. I took him to the camp chaplain, who offered to counsel me on what had happened as well, but I didn't want to talk about it. Me and my best friend go camping. He's relatively new to the hobby, so he's been tagging along with me, as I have plenty of experience camping and solo backpacking. I took him to a beginner-friendly backcountry camping site that I've gone to a dozen times with various friends. It's important to note that I've never stayed overnight there alone. It was a quick two-nighter, and we got incredibly lazy the second night and did not walk the garbage to the car, instead leaving it out for the five hours I would be sleeping, as I had to be out of the campgrounds by 630 for work. We slept in separate tents next to each other because of my early dismissal. I jump up out of bed at 5 a.m. to hear footsteps going past my tent, left to right. I listen closely to try and identify what animal it could be, but it sounded very human. I flashed my light outside my tent, and as quick as I beeped my light, the walking stopped. I panned my light and saw nothing. More importantly, I heard nothing, no scurrying away or running, just pure silence besides the crickets. Obviously startled, I lay awake on my phone, refusing to go back to sleep. Roughly 10 minutes later, I hear something going through the garbage. Odd, as the garbage was on the left of my tent, but I never heard anyone else walking outside. Whatever was going through the trash was ferociously looking through it, not like an animal skimming the top and working its way down. I flash my light again and yell out, A. Hey. Again, silence. No running away, nothing. I stayed sitting up with my light beaming outside the entire time. I don't alert my friend, because although I'm pretty creeped out, it could just be a skunk or raccoon. At first daylight, I jump out of my tent and go straight to the garbage to put everything back in. Untouched. It was exactly the way we left it. I'm truly frustrated, I feel like my mind is playing tricks on me, and I just want to pack up, leave, and give my friend the heads up of possible animals in the area before departing. As I'm packing up, I hear the car doors open and close twice, located roughly 40 to 50 yards away behind a heavy tree line. My fight or flight response kicks in, and at this point, I'm convinced someone is ducking with us, so I choose to fight. I grab my axe and head over to the cars. When I'm maybe 15 yards out, I round a corner and see my best friend walking towards me. Me, what the hell are you doing here? BF, I fell asleep in the car. Me, were you walking around the campsite an hour ago? BF, no, I've been in the car the whole night. Me, you were still at the campfire when I called it a night. When did you go to the car? BF, truthfully, I can't remember. It was at that moment that the realization came over me that I was at the campsite entirely alone, being tormented by something I couldn't see or identify. A sudden chill coursed throughout my entire body. I told my friend I would explain everything later, but please pack your shit and leave with me. I went to bed back home with a nightlight on for five nights. I'm just now able to tell this story. This happened one evening in the summer of 1984 or thereabouts. 
I was a teenager walking around with three friends in the general area of the suburban neighborhood where we all lived. There wasn't a lot to do, so it was common for kids our age to stroll around at night, talking, laughing, and getting into minor mischief. There was a large wild area with streams, a swampy area, lots of trees, and a rocky area with mounds of dirt. It was an area of several acres, mostly surrounded by single-family homes in a few adjacent neighborhoods. There were houses on three sides, and on the fourth, a large empty field, an elementary school, and some municipal buildings. There was a narrow asphalt path that ran through the middle of the area, presumably to provide a way for kids to walk to and from the school. The whole area was referred to as the path. It had a reputation among the kids as a scary and dangerous place. In my mind as a child, the Manson family, or the Shrewsbury equivalent, was living there, holding satanic rituals and sacrificing kids like me. In reality, the scariest thing was older kids smoking pot and drinking pilfered bottles of Michelob in the woods or making out in shady leafy hollows. So on this particular evening, it was Frank, Keith, Brian, and me wandering around aimlessly. We decided to walk down a dead-end street and cut through the yards into the woods of the path. It was dusk, and the light was fading completely as we cut through, stepping over an old stone wall and into the dense underbrush. We didn't have a flashlight, and the only way we could see where we were going was to spark the flint wheel on an empty big lighter one of us had. It provided a quick, dim strobe flash through which we could get our bearings. We picked our way single file through the underbrush to a narrow, flowing brook. There was a fallen log across the stream, so it was a quick one-two step to cross it. On the other side, as we knew from playing in the woods, was a narrow dirt path that ran perpendicular to and intersected with the asphalt paved main path off to our left, maybe 100 yards away. To the right, the path continued through the dense brush, made a 90-degree turn, and traversed a slight rise through a forested area, ending in the large field by the school. One by one, we quick-stepped across the log over the stream and pushed through the bushes onto the overgrown, dark, narrow path. I was third in line, Frank and Keith having gone first. As I emerged from the brush and as Brian was making his way across, I heard Keith's voice shrill and frightened. There's someone standing right there. Frank and Keith were to my left, facing in my direction. I whipped my head to the right, and sure enough, there was a man standing there, not six feet from me. It wasn't a tree, it was just a dark, silent shape. Appeared solid. A man-shaped blotch is darker than the darkness. No question. A man was standing there. I could make out the round brim of a hat that appeared to be tilted back on his head, so the outline was ovalish, not a horizontal line of a hat pulled low across the forehead. The figure was silent. Unmoving. As I stared in terror, the figure shifted slightly, maybe turning or raising an arm. Somehow, my impression of this was not movement but a subtle change in the shape of the silhouette. It was unclear what the movement was, but it was just that it was a slightly different outline, but it displayed no perceptible motion. We broke and ran away in a panic, truly scared for sure, but laughing and hooting hysterically, leaving poor Brian behind to be murdered. We reached the asphalt path and stopped, catching our breath, with Brian arriving a few seconds behind us. He hadn't seen a thing and was somewhat perplexed, to say the least. As we stood panting and jabbering under a streetlight at the south end of the path, we compared what we had seen. Frank and Keith concurred with what I had seen, a slim, silent man in a hat. Then Keith said, when I was looking at it, it sort of changed. It didn't move, but it changed shape. That gave me goosebumps, since that was the same subjective observation that I had had. Brian didn't see a thing. Poor Brian. The dirt path was very overgrown, with weeds and bushes all but obscuring it. It was disused by that point, so it wasn't easy going and wasn't a route one would take as a reasonable choice, especially at night. That is what made it particularly frightening. To encounter someone standing silent and motionless, exactly where we happened to emerge onto the path after crossing the brook. Who was it, and why were they just standing there? How did they get there, and why didn't they speak to us? Why were they wearing what appeared to be a farmer's hat? All of these things flashed quickly through my mind when I saw the figure, but in one sudden jolt, they arrived all at once as a giant WTF. In a primal part of my brain. My impression was that of a slim man in his 30s or 40s, about 5 feet 8 inches minus 10. Kind of the same build as my doctor as a kid, who always reminded me of a guy from the Civil War era because he was short, thin, and serious. Was it one of the residents of the neighborhood who, perturbed by the obnoxious teenagers cutting through his yard, somehow silently and quickly threaded his way through the dense, dark underbrush in order to menacingly glower at us in silence? It could have been, and if so, that in itself is terrifying. Bravo on scarring us for life, Dr. B. 
I am still in touch with Frank, and we talk about that experience from time to time. Nearly 40 years later, it still gives me chills to recall the encounter.